Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Next Generation Probiotics Targeting C. difficile Infection, presented by Dr. Jennifer Spindler, Instructor, Pathology and Immunology, Baylor College of Medicine. We are excited to bring you this educational webcast presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. I'm Julie Simaroff of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credit. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Spindler. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Julie. I am I'm excited to be here today to share with you my work on beneficial microbes, specifically using probiotics to target antimicrobial-associated diarrhea caused by Clostridium difficile infection. Probiotics are defined as live organisms that, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on their host. Probiotic bacteria have a wide range of beneficial characteristics. Um, some include the production of antimicrobial agents that can inhibit the growth of pathogens. Other beneficial microbes are able to produce vitamins that enhance host nutrition, while yet still other strains can secrete factors that have direct impacts on um, the immune system and decreasing inflammation in their hosts. Now, the probiotic concept is not a new concept. Um, a Russian scientist uh, and Nobel laureate, Eli Metchnikoff, first pioneered this concept in the early 20th century. He was very aware of the long lives of rural Europeans, and he had proposed that their longevity was in part due to their consumption of lactic acid bacteria. Um, they consume lactic acid bacteria in fermented milk products as a normal daily part of their diet. Now, fast forward 100 years and researchers are beginning to study the microbiome. Um, the microbiome project was launched by the National Institutes of Health in 2007 with the purpose of cataloging all of the bacteria in and on a healthy human. Um, the purpose for starting a major effort in uncovering the bacteria that live in and on our bodies was to help us gain an understanding of how the human host and our microbiota have co-evolved and how microbiome stability is important in uh, sustaining human health. Now the first um, first parts, the first the beginnings of human microbiome research was definitely focused on determining what microbes are there, beneficial or simply commensal organisms that are present in and on a healthy human body. But the field has evolved to be able to distinguish differences in microbiomes of healthy humans versus those with disease. Um, we do know that some disease states can be reversed with microbiome replacement therapy. However, um, I am more interested in learning whether or not we can restore a disease state to a healthy microbiome uh, by manipulating it with specific 
probiotics. Now, as you can imagine, the field of human microbiome research has had a significant impact on the probiotic field. There is a growing public interest in microbe-containing foods and a rising use of probiotics in the clinic. Surveys show that doctors are making general recommendations for uh, the use of probiotics in gastrointestinal disease as well as antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And while this is all well and good, um, I hope that when I'm finished speaking with you today that you'll understand that uh, we need more specific recommendations. We need better research and studies into the specific beneficial characteristics of specific probiotics targeting very specific um, diseases. So one application of probiotics that is clearly relevant is the use of them to prevent antibiotic-associated disease. Now, we are currently entering an antibiotic crisis. Sir Alexander Fleming uh, warned us of this back as early as 1945 when penicillin became widely used. Um, his warning was that antibiotic abuse would uh, result in severe antibiotic resistance and the drugs would no longer be effective. Um, along with the rise in um, emerging resistance of bacterial pathogens, we've also had a significant decrease in the discovery of new antibiotics over the past 30 years. So here we have now the antibiotic crisis where we're running out of drugs capable of containing and treating um, pathogenic infections. These estimated U.S. costs um, are up in the billions, so there's $20 billion in healthcare costs annually uh, due to antibiotic resistance and um, approximately $35 billion a year lost in productivity. So there is a dire need for alternative therapies to prevent antibiotic associated disease. And the CDC has um, categorized certain diseases as urgent, with Clostridium difficile disease being one of them. C. difficile infection is the leading cause of healthcare associated infections in the United States, with nearly half a million hospitalizations and a cost of $4.8 billion annually. Um, this is definitely considered one of the diseases of a uh, disrupted microbiome. It occurs when the normal gut microbiota are disrupted by antibiotic use. We do know that we can restore um, health to patients with recurrent C. difficile infection by uh, administering uh, fecal microbial transplants. So using fecal microbial material to restore a healthy microbiota to the intestine can prevent recurrent infection. However, this kind of treatment is not ideal. Um, and currently there are no specific guidelines that recommend uh, probiotics for preventing C. difficile infection. However, there are quite a bit of literature out there supporting their use in preventing C. difficile infection. Uh, for example, this Cochrane review was published in 2013 where they asked, do probiotics prevent C. difficile associated infection in patients on antibiotics? And they showed in their meta-analysis that there were, out of 23 studies and over 4,000 participants, that there was a 64% reduced risk in patients um, on antibiotics getting C. difficile infection. Additionally, they were able to determine that there was a 20% decrease in almost 4,000 participants in uh, symptoms of C. difficile infection. And based on this analysis, these authors concluded that probiotics are safe and effective for preventing C. difficile associated disease. Additionally, there are a few other clinical trials out there showing that um, specific formulations in, that, that contain probiotic organisms are capable of preventing uh, recurrent C. difficile infection. Um, this study by Johan Bakken um, using LifeWay kefir 
uh, combined with a staggered and tapered antibiotic withdrawal treatment showed that there was an 84% success rate in preventing recurrent C. difficile infection in elderly patients. There were also no com comorbidities associated with this treatment. And uh, he, he concluded that staggered and tapered antibiotic withdrawal combined with keeper supplementation could be as effective at preventing recurrent C. difficile infection as fecal microbial transplantation. Additionally, um, hospitals in Canada have, have implemented the use of BioK Plus in their systems. Um, after a major C. difficile outbreak in 2003, uh, particular hospitals started prescribing BioK Plus to all inpatient adults that were on antibiotics, regardless of other um, health issues. So within two to 12 hours of initial antibiotic doses, um, these patients received a minimum of 30 days of BioK Plus. And this resulted in a 73% reduction in CDI incidence and a 39% reduction in C. difficile infection recurrence. They also have noted that in 10 years of using BioK Plus in their patients, there have been zero complications from lactobacilli in their patient population. So this brings me to my main research question, and that is how do host bacteria protect against C. difficile? So we believe that the Achilles heel of C. difficile pathogenesis is in its susceptibility to secreted antimicrobials by the host microbiota, um, and that we could use specific probiotic formulations, administer them to patients at high risk of developing CDI, and that that may, in fact, decrease disease incidence in this vulnerable patient population. We know that patients on antibiotics have an increased relative abundance in the presence of Lactobacilli aceae. Lactobacilli aceae is the family of bacteria that um, contain lactic acid bacteria. The, uh, the interesting thing here is that antibiotic treatment creates an environment that's selective for lactic acid bacteria. Lactic acid bacteria happen to be intrinsically resistant to most antibiotics that we use today. And so these organisms, while resistant, they're intrinsically or naturally resistant, which is non-transferable. And by targeting a lactic acid bacteria as a probiotic, we are using an organism that could withstand an environment that is fought with antimicrobials. The lactobacillus um, are lactic or lactic acid bacteria are central in the GI, micro, GI microbiome development. Now, the human research spinning out of uh, microbiome research initiatives by uh, Domingos Bello et al. has shown that uh, just simply delivery, differences in delivery of uh, children at birth can change their microbiome initially. So when you look at this um, graph here on on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see that there are um, circles representing microbiomes of babies or uh, the microbiomes of their mothers. And in light pink, you can see that the uh, babies were delivered vaginally and have microbiomes very similar to their mother's vaginal microbiota, which is mostly uh, made up of lactobacilli and lactic acid bacteria. On the other hand, you have um, microbiomes represented in blue, and these babies in, represented by the light blue circles were delivered by cesarean, and their microbiomes more readily uh, mimic those of microbiota from the skin 
and not necessarily specifically the mother's skin microbiota. So we can see here that by normal delivery, uh, babies are initially colonized with vaginal microbiota, and that consists of a lot of lactobacillus. Um, additionally, um, after vertical transmission of lactobacilli from mother to child, um, we also have additional sources of lactic acid bacteria that contribute to the microbiome development of the GI tract, and that's uh, breast milk. So breast milk is a maternal source of microbes that's rich in lactic acid bacteria, and it provides a secondary inoculation um, and also nutrition for the infant GI microbiota. So based on this information, we decided to determine whether or not there were lactic acid bacteria or also probiotic, known probiotic organisms that may be resistant to antimicrobial drugs that are currently used to treat Clostridium difficile infection. When thinking about using a probiotic to target the prevention of an antimicrobial associated disease, it's important that your probiotic organism is able to withstand the harsh antimicrobial treatments the patients might already be taking. So we looked at several different probiotic organisms, Lactobacillus reuteri, Lactobacillus casei, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, and Lactobacillus gasseri, and we were able to show that um, Lactobacillus reuteri uh, was our most resistant probiotic to drugs currently used to treat C. difficile infection. Uh, antibiotics vancomycin, fidexamycin, and metronidazole are currently the most common uh, antibiotics used to treat C. difficile, and lactobacillus reuteri is highly resistant at minimum inhibitory concentrations significantly greater than those used um, to kill uh, C. difficile. So with that, we have focused our efforts on characterizing lactobacillus reuteri strains as a potential probiotic for prevention of C. difficile infection. Now lactobacillus reuteri is a known probiotic. It has been characterized extensively in the literature and never been shown to be associated with disease. It's indigenous to the GI tract of many mammals and birds and has also been isolated from human breast milk. Human-derived strains produce a variety of factors beneficial to human health, and those include the production of antimicrobials, specifically the antimicrobial reuterin uh, that's been shown to be uh, inhibitory to specific GI pathogens. Lactobacillus reuteri can produce vitamins. Uh, in this case, uh, our human drive strains produce vitamin B12. And um, additionally, specific strains of l reuteri can produce histamine in the GI tract, which works as an infl inflammation modulator. It's able to suppress inflammation um, in the host. In an earlier study, um, we took some genetic information from several isolates of lactobacillus reuteri strains. We took whole genomes and did whole genome comparisons to get a better idea of the specific traits inherent to different groups of L. reuteri strains that had evolved down different paths to determine whether or not um, one strain might be more suited for uh, use in antimicrobial associated disease prevention. So this slide basically is going to help you understand the data I show you on the next slide. We did pairwise genomic comparisons, um, whole genome comparisons, uh, looking at the uh, similarity in nucleotide sequence as well as the similarity in gene content. And when we take a look at the data in this way and plot it in um, a, a graph similar to what you see on this slide, we are able to determine whether or not 
specific strains have evolved in different environments and how different their gene content might be from one another. If, if data uh, is represented here on the graph, you can see that they have less um, nucleotide similarity uh, at the uh, base uh, pair resolution level, as well as um, less gene content similarity, showing that they would have a variety of different uh, traits that help them survive in their environment. If you find data plotted closer to the origin of the graph, um, they have very similar gene content and nucleotide identity. So based on these kinds of analyses, um, looking at several genomes of Lactobacillus rotary derived from three different hosts, we were able to show that, as expected, you might note that um, gene content and DNA similarity are quite different uh, when comparing Lactobacillus rotary species that have co-evolved with different hosts. You're looking at this graph on the left, um, the different colors represent different hosts. So Lactobacillus rotary strains isolated from humans are represented by blue diamonds, while Lactobacillus rotary uh, genomes are, that were isolated from strains derived from pigs are represented by red stars. Uh, we also have Lactobacillus rotary isolates from rodents represented in the green circles. Um, the cluster of data shown here in this portion of the graph indicates that the genomes of these strains are quite different. While they are similar enough to be considered Lactobacillus rotary of the same species, they are not as um, identical as genomes isolated from the same host. Um, Interestingly, when we look at the second graph closer to the right, remove all genomes from other non-human hosts um, and look at different groups of Lactobacillus rotary isolated from humans, we can see immediately that the different groups or clades as they're referred to on the graph are just as different from each other um, let me point this out here. So for example, clade 2 versus clade 6 comparisons <coughs> are not as identical as one might think. Additionally, when you compare a clade 6 versus a clade 6, you can see that it's very similar. And so while these kinds of uh, whole genome comparisons give us insight into how different um, host-derived uh, strains of Lactobacillus rotary are, uh, we wanted to look closer at specific human-derived Lactobacillus rotary. So in the graph on the right, we have eliminated all genomes derived from strains from, hum from hosts like pigs and rodents and just specifically are looking at human-derived strains. And if you remember in the graph, um, in, in the tree I showed a couple of slides ago, there were two uh, specific clades or groups of human-derived L. rotary. And when we compare genomes between those two clades, clade 2 and 6, we can see that genomes from these two clades are as different from one another as they are from genomes of strains isolated from pigs or rodents. So this gave us our first clear evidence that while human-derived lactobacillus rotary are known to be probiotics and they have a variety of beneficial characteristics, these characteristics are definitely strain-specific and unique to specific evolutionary uh, groups of Lactobacillus rotary. So this slide summarizes uh, some of the different probiotic characteristics of human-derived Lactobacillus rotary. 
uh, you can see that um, they both both groups of L. rotary produce antimicrobial called reuterin. Uh, one group produces it better than the other. Uh, these um, groups produce vitamins, a uh, variety of vitamins, vitamin B12, uh, vitamin B2, B1, uh, and uh, folate. And additionally, immunomodulatory factors are produced by both groups of human-derived lactobacillus reuteri. Um, while we have identified, uh, others have identified the uh, molecule histamine um, as anti-inflammatory uh, factor produced by the clade 2 L. reuteri strains, uh, we know that other factors unknown are produced by the clade 6 L. reuteri strains and impact uh, immune function on the host. For the re remainder of my talk, I'm going to focus on the production of reuterin by lactobacillus reuteri and how we can exploit that uh, beneficial uh, characteristic to target antibiotic-associated C. difficile infection. In previous work, I was able to show that reuterin produced by a variety of lactobacillus reuteri strains was capable of inhibiting enteric pathogens. So on this graph, you're looking at the percent growth of a particular enteric pathogen, whether it be EHEC, ETEC, Salmonella enterica, Shigella sanae, or Vibrio cholerae. Um, you can see when no reuterin is in the assay that you have 100% growth of the pathogen. If we use uh, reuterin produced from one of four different L. reuteri strains indicated here, uh, we are able to inhibit the growth of each of these pathogens by 95%. Um, Reuterin is the antimicrobial compound produced by Lactobacillus reuteri. It is a small molecule. It contains absolutely no protein component, and it is produced during glycerol fermentation by a vitamin B12 dependent glycerol dehydratase. Uh, reuterin has been characterized in the literature to have broad spectrum effects. It can inhibit gram positive and gram negative bacteria as well as some yeast and fungi. And when we can, um, the genetic uh, elements responsible for reuterin production are present in a 58 gene cluster that was acquired by horizontal gene transfer. Um, these genes, uh, the cluster of genes here on the right, on the left, um, are important for the conversion of glycerol to reuterin. There is a POCR gene that's important for um, activating transcription of the genes in this gene cluster. There's the glycerol dehydratase that is directly responsible for converting glycerol to reuterin. And the second arm of this gene cluster is required for de novo vitamin B12 synthesis and um, the organism uses the vitamin B12 produced here to activate the glycerol dehydratase, which then converts glycerol to reuterin. Now we see this gene cluster in all of our human-derived strains to date. Um, they are different in amino acid identity between the two clades that I've been describing throughout the talk. And they have different capabilities. These two groups have different capabilities of producing reuterin, uh, most likely due to the genetic differences seen in the 58 gene cluster. So when we look at a variety of um, strains in each clade, uh, you can see that strains from clade 2 uh, produce reuterin, but uh, far be it lower levels than 
strings uh, in clade 6. And based on this uh, data, we decided to move forward in testing prototypical strains from each clade and their ability to inhibit C. difficile infection. So when we look at lactobacillus reutery and its ability to inhibit C. difficile, um, we were very pleased. We found that, in fact, reuterine does inhibit C. difficile. You're looking at uh, some overlay assays here on the left-hand side. We're testing two strains, a clade 6 strain, which is called 17938, and a clade 2 strain, which is referred to as 6475. Um, you can see in these plates that l rotary is spotted. Um, let me get the arrow for you. l rotary is spotted here and developed in a spot on the auger media. C. difficile is then overlaying on these spots in a soft auger where it's allowed to grow as a lawn in the um, top layer. And when glycerol is available to lactobacillus reutery as we've made it in this assay, it can convert glycerol to reuterin and then results in this zone of clearance that you see around the l rotary spot, which is indicating that reuterin is produced and capable of inhibiting the growth of C. difficile. When we knock out uh, or make a mutant in lactobacillus reutery, uh, in the gene responsible for activating the gene expression of the 58 gene cluster. We also uh, prevent rotorin production by l rotary, which then is uh, giving us a strain or a mutant that is incapable of inhibiting C. difficile infection. Additionally, what we're showing in this assay is a disc that contains five micrograms of vancomycin. If you'll remember earlier in my talk, I uh, mentioned that vancomycin is one of the drugs used to treat C. difficile infection. And you can see here a zone of clearance showing inhibition of C. difficile. Um, and the really key point uh, for us is that the lactobacillus rotary strain 17938 and production of reuterine by the strain was capable of inhibiting C. difficile in a far greater manner than the vancomycin disc, uh, the drug currently used to treat. Additionally, what we're showing here is that uh, there's strain-specific effects in, him, in the inhibition. Now, I'm going to call your attention to the graph here at the top right. And this is showing order in production by these two strains. You can see that here, this um, clade 6 isolate 17938 is able to produce significantly greater amounts of reuterin than the clade 2 or 6475 strain. And this um, phenotype coincides nicely with the inhibition that we see in the zones of clearance by these two strains. So you can see that uh, our clade 6 isolate that is capable of producing the most rotorin is also capable of inhibiting C. difficile the best. So with this, um, we have gone on to ask whether or not um, we can see inhibition of C. difficile in a microbial community. These are nice in vitro assays that give us a proof of concept, but when you mix the uh, probiotic and the pathogen amongst a variety of other organisms, would the phenotype still hold true? And so in order to get at this question, we teamed up with other investigators over at Baylor, Dr. Robert Britton and Jennifer Octo. Um, they have a mini bioreactor array system and an assay developed specifically to look at C. difficile invasion of micro microbial communities. So in this uh, assay, they um, use fecal, human fecal content to inoculate these 
uh, small containers or mini bioreactors. Um, they will culture fecal content in these bioreactors, disrupt them with antibiotics, inoculate with C. diff, and um, watch C. diff or monitor C. diff levels as time goes on. We teamed up with these uh, investigators to test whether or not the treatment of a, an antibiotic-treated community with lactobacillus reutery and its substrate glycerol could in, in effect prevent C. difficile um, from growing in these microbial communities. So in our uh, experiment, we followed this uh, timeline that, that you can see here at the bottom of the screen. Um, these bioreactors were inoculated with fecal content and allowed to uh, establish a community over a day. Um, flow was started after 24 hours and the community was established over um, a couple of days. After a few days, the bioreactors were treated with clindamycin, an antimicrobial known to um, generate susceptible microbial communities, communities susceptible to C. difficile invasion. After antibiotic treatment, we um, decided to test four groups. We had control reactors that received C. difficile alone, just to show that our microbial communities that had been disrupted by antibiotics could, in fact, support the growth of the pathogen. Uh, we had reactors that received lactobacillus reutery um, to see if just by providing L. reutery in these communities, we could inhibit C. difficile infection. We had reactors <clears throat> that received only the substrate glycerol, and then reactors that received both the substrate glycerol and lactobacillus reutery to determine whether or not active production of reuterin in a microbial community could prevent C. difficile infection. This slide basically is showing that um, microbial communities generated in these bioreactors mimic those that we see in patients with C. difficile infection. Here on the left, I'm showing you an alpha diversity plot um, indicating that in bioreactors before antibiotics, uh, you have similar um, you have similar numbers of species seen uh, in these bioreactors without antibiotics as compared to individuals, healthy individual fecal samples. Additionally, um, after antibiotic treatment, you see a decrease in the amount of observed species in reactors uh, that is similar to what you see in patients who have been on, on antibiotics and diagnosed with Clostridium difficile infection. Um, additionally, when we look more globally at microbiome uh, community structure, over here on the right, you can see uh, here in the bottom what I'm showing you is basically the kinds of bacteria that are associated with healthy uh, pediatric fecal specimens. So the nodes in the center of this uh, cluster of uh, shapes and colors represent patients or healthy, healthy children uh, specimens and the squares on the outside are the kinds of bacteria that are associated with these uh, healthy individuals. When we look at the bacteria associated with uh, patients that have been diagnosed with C. difficile infection, shown here in red, um, you can see a definite shift in the kinds of bacteria that are associated um, which are indicated by the different colors here. When we look <clears throat> the same way at the communities present in the bioreactors, we see very similar types of bacteria associated with bioreactors before antibiotics. 
And after antibiotic treatment, you see a shift in community members that mimic what we see down here in the patient microbiota. So overall, this mini bioreactor array and C. difficile infection model mimics what we see in human hosts and is a good model for us to be able to study this kind of treatment in vitro. So now I'm showing you data from our uh, mini bioreactor array experiment. Um, we recall that we had um, mini bioreactor arrays that established their communities um, for a few days before any uh, manipulations, and you can see their microbiome represented here. Uh, the groups in red represent control reactors that only received antibiotics and C. difficile. Shapes colored in green were also infected with C. difficile and received antibiotic treatment, but also uh, were given lactobacillus reutery. Uh, shapes in blue uh, received lactobacillus reutery and glycerol, and in theory were capable of producing reuterin, and shapes in black received the substrate along with no probiotic lactobacillus reutery. In the beginning, uh, before any manipulation, you can see that um, the untreated human fecal communities from all reactors cluster together and show that they have very similar microbial communities. Um, after antibiotic treatment, all reactors, uh, communities in the reactor shifted similarly um, and are shown here in this group. After the addition of glycerol, we can see a second shift, and that's represented here uh, in the shapes that are colored blue and black. Um, it's uh, not, there's not a, um, a recognizable shift in shapes colored in blue that received both l rotary and glycerol. Uh, this is indicating to us that just by providing glycerol in the media, we have um, initiated uh, a shift in microbes that can use glycerol as a carbon source. But the presence of l rotary doesn't shift this uh, any more significantly than just the substrate alone. When we look more specifically at whether or not um, lactobacillus reutery in the presence of glycerol can inhibit C. difficile in these reactors, we were pleasantly surprised. Um, using qPCR with primer specific to C. difficile, um, we were able to show that in our control reactors and reactors that only received a rotary, C. difficile was able to uh, take hold in these communities. I'm showing you here control in red, a rotary in green. And after C. difficile inoculation, um, post antibiotic treatment, uh, C. difficile counts increase significantly. You can also see that C. difficile uh, counts increase quite a bit with the presence of glycerol. So glycerol is not specifically inhibiting C. difficile growth. Um, and while these counts seem a little bit higher than the control reactors, the data is not significantly different. The most important piece of information from this data is the fact that when we provide lactobacillus reutery and glycerol together, we see a significant decrease in the ability of C. difficile to grow in these micro microbial communities. Um, this is indicating to us that from the previous slide, where we did not see a significant shift in microbial community structure in the presence of both l rotary and glycerol, we do see a specific decrease in C. difficile uh, colonization of these microbial communities. And furthermore, when we test the ability of lactobacillus reutery and glycerol to inhibit C. difficile ex vivo, um, we have the same results. So in experiments using germ-free mouse feces, we were able to show that 
by providing lactobacillus reuteri and the substrate glycerol, we can in fact inhibit C. difficile from growing in this uh, media. So um, with this, we are hopeful that uh, we are onto something important, that lactobacillus reuteri, a proven probiotic, given the proper substrate, could be used as a potential um, preventative treatment to C. difficile infection. So our current and future directions uh, continue to develop next generation probiotics, uh, which are defined as commensal derived bacteria that um, will make specific health claims to treat and prevent disease, and that the probiotic, the next generation probiotic of interest here is one that's designed specifically to prevent C. difficile infection in high risk patient populations. Um, additionally, we're interested in optimi optimizing our delivery strategy strategies. Currently, lactobacillus rotary is provided in formulations um, as a single strain or in combination with another strain. But if we could uh, devise formulations that included uh, the substrate glycerol in a manner that uh, precluded other organisms in the GI tract from utilizing the substrate, uh, specifically directing it to L. reuteri, allowing L. reuteri to synthesize the antimicrobial reuterin um, and target this to the colon, the site of infection, that we could uh, further uh, benefit from the development of this next generation probiotic. So in summary, I've discussed beneficial microbes and our specific efforts at using a targeted probiotic uh, strategy at preventing an antibiotic associated disease. And this kind of new therapy would be crucial in fighting our current uh, antibiotic resistance crisis with C. difficile infection now being treated with antibiotics. It's initially caused by the use of antibiotics and then further treated by subsequent antibiotic use. Um, if we could, in theory, use a probiotic formulation that would prevent C. difficile infection uh, in patients on antibiotics, we could also, in theory, decrease uh, the use of further, uh, further use of antibiotics that would be required to treat a subsequent infection. So with that, I uh, would like to offer some acknowledgments to the funding agencies, the NIH, uh, the Texas Children's Microbiome Center for supporting this work, and my collaborators, um, Tor Savage, Rob Britton, and Jennifer Octung. Um, additionally, a special thanks to uh, Aaron Brown, who is um, my right hand in the lab and uh, has provided a lot of the um, effort going towards the data I've shown you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spindler, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the presentation. Let's get started. Our first question is, can reuterin be supplied directly to inhibit C. difficile? So reuterin, as a small molecule, it is, it is a reactive aldehyde, and it is extremely reactive. We have done experiments where we have tried to provide reuterin in the mini bioreactors uh, directly and inhibit C. difficile. However, this has been unsuccessful, and our thoughts on this 
are that rotarin is immediately um, deactivated as it's added to the bacterial communities. So in our um, experience, this treatment method requires uh, the live probiotic and the availability of the substrate to work in concert uh, during an active infection. So the, the short answer is no, we can't at this time use Reuterin to directly treat the infection. Thank you. Is there any concern that l Reutery could transfer their resistance to the antibiotics used to treat C. difficile? So that's a great question. Um, we are definitely, as I've mentioned, worried about the transfer of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and our lack or inability to be able to contain um, resistant organisms. The nice thing about lactic acid bacteria is that they are intrinsically resistant. So they have not acquired their resistance characteristics from other microbes. They are just naturally resistant. And these um, natural mechanisms of resistance are not considered to be transferable. They don't. Um, exist on mobile elements of DNA that can readily exchange between organisms. So the, um, the ability of l to withstand um, vancomycin, fidaxomycin, and metronidazole is um, due to their natural resistance and uh, is thought to be highly unlikely that it could be transferable. Thank you for that answer. We'll wrap up with one last question, and that question is, if fecal microbiota transplantation works to treat recurrent C. difficile infection, why do we need specific probiotics to prevent this disease? Thanks, Julie. That's another great question. Um, it is true that uh, right now um, a lot of institutions are using fecal microbial transplantation to treat patients with severe recurrent CDI. Um, the idea behind this therapy is that they are able to completely replace the uh, diseased and disrupted microbiota of the infected individual with microbes from a healthy individual, and that this is enough to uh, take care of the infection that they continue to uh, recur after multiple uh, rounds of antibiotics. We are just beginning to understand um, the kinds of downstream fallout that can occur from an FMT or fecal microbial transplantation. When we do these kinds of transplants, we don't know exactly everything that we're transplanting. Um, there could be downstream long-term health effects that result from these kinds of transfers. Uh, for example, there is um, a documentation in the literature showing that a woman who received a, a FMT uh, from her relative uh, became overweight after after the, the treatment. So um, just as we've seen in mice, if you transfer fecal material from obese mice to lean mice, you can um, result in uh, creating an obese mouse that never had a weight issue. Um, there's also been reports of transference of high blood pressure and other um, kinds of disease. So while we are able to screen the fecal microbial con, uh, material for uh, pathogens that we know of, and we've screened the donors 
by diet and BMI and other very specific um, health factors, we still are transferring a lot of unknown uh, content into our patients. And right now, FMT is basically a Band-Aid. We're using it because we need it and we have to, and that's what's saving patients. But it shouldn't be the long-term um, treatment option. We should strive to have better, specific, cleaner um, treatment modalities. I would like to once again thank Dr. Spindler for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? Thank you, Julie. I appreciated um, taking the time today to be able to share my work with uh, Lab Roots and your respective audience. Um, I hope that I've left you with enough information to understand um, how probiotics and beneficial microbes might be of use uh, to future medical, um, medical questions and how um, we aim to use specific strains with specific uh, characteristics to fight uh, specific disease. So thank you very much. Thank you once again, Dr. Spindler. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 14, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.